You're listening to the Mississippi Outdoors Podcast. I'm your host, Matt Wyatt. Our guest, we're talking fishing with fisheries coordinator at MDWFP, Mr. Dennis Rickey. This episode of the Mississippi Outdoors Podcast is brought to you by the Foundation for Mississippi Wildlife, Fisheries, and Parks. You're listening to the Mississippi Outdoors Podcast. I'm your host, Matt Wyatt. On today's episode, we're talking fishing and really anything regarding fishing. Stuff that's in the lake, stuff that's in the boat. That's with longtime Mississippi Department of Wildlife Fisheries biologist, Dennis Rickey. Dennis, thanks for being on the show here today at the Mississippi Outdoors Podcast. Hope you're doing well. Well, I am. Thanks for having me. So, r- real quick, this is how many years for you here at NBWFP? Uh, 35. 35 years. Yeah. Went by in a flash. It did. It really did. <laughs> yeah. Now, now take me back to sort of those, those early years. You, we were talking just a little bit ago about your college years at Mississippi State in the early 80s. What led you to Mississippi Department of Wildlife, Fisheries, and Parks? Well, I had, I had got a master's degree at Mississippi State, and I wanted to be a district fisheries biologist. That was my career goal. And uh, I happened to land a job up in Kansas, in northeast Kansas, where I was a district fisheries biologist. And um, I was in charge of the management of three state fishing lakes and a federal reservoir and some community uh, ponds. And then I decided that I needed to get back to the southeast. And I went to Crowley, Louisiana, where they had an agricultural experiment station and it was mainly concerned with rice, but we were on the crawfish rice project. So we grew different types of rice, varieties of rice, to maximize crawfish yield and, um, and rice yield. And then my, my boss left. He was, he was a graduate of Mississippi State, and he came t- to MSU to be over the Cooperative Extension in Wildlife and Fisheries. So I decided that you know, the, the project wasn't going to do any research, so I started reaching out and looking for jobs, and he's the one that told me that wildlife, it was Department of Wildlife Conservation at the time, yeah. but they were looking for someone. So I came, and the first thing I did was um, a research project looking at the conditions when fish leave those federal reservoirs, when they release water, you know, when do they leave, how many leave? Mm. Do we have a problem? And from there, I just inherited other projects. And uh, so, you know, just been doing a bunch of things since then. Yeah. So, so that first project, studying those reservoirs, the the inflow and outflow of water and what it did to the fish population, kind of basically, what did you find back then? So this was at Enid Reservoir. Okay. And... Um, that all of them except Sardis uh, have a, an extreme drawdown uh, in coming into the fall, and they have a winter pool level, and and then they allow the reservoir to go back up starting in mid January to reach the the summer pool. Yeah. So what happened in one year was it was really cold, and they got a big rain, and the reservoir pool level jumped up, and they released the water. At, uh, you know, as fast as they could without doing any downstream flooding. And so there were some crappie, big crappie, that showed up in the spillway, and they were uh, uh, suffering from pressure shock, and they were damaged from going through these big concrete uh, pipes that go through the, the reservoir, and they wanted to know if they had a problem. Well, what we figured out was... Uh, that we had to catch the fish going through the reservoir, and that was the most difficult part. And we found a firm in uh, in the Northwest that built us, uh, designed and built nets to go down in that big uh, water control tower. Wow! Just upstream where they they released the fish, and um, most of the fish were less than four inches long that we lost, and it was principally gizzard shad, and crappie. Uh, But we sampled in the morning, at night, before dawn. Uh, We found that you would lose more fish at the same uh, 
volume of water being released, you'd lose more fish at night than in the daytime. Hmm. You'd lose more fish when the pool level was low because they were more concentrated. Um, you would lose more fish um, the more water they released, but temperature wasn't uh, a problem. Hmm. So the temperature didn't really play mm -mm. that much of a factor. And mm -mm. most people would think that it would, mm -hmm. actually. Yeah, and and we did, uh, uh, the University of Mississippi did some swimming speeds with crappie in a swim tunnel, and what they found, I remember the professor telling me when the water temperature was 41 degrees and he put the fish in the swim tunnel, they wouldn't swim. They just got uh, washed back along the, the little, little grating, and he said, I thought I killed them, but when he put them <laughs> back in, in warmer water, they, they started swimming, so... Their swimming is impaired when it gets really cold. Right, and yeah. cold-blooded fish, and 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 they eat a little less, or at least that's the the idea too for us fishermen. Who we go on cold days, we don't catch as many. Right. We tell ourselves they don't eat as much when it's cold. Well, they don't need to, right? Because they're cold-blooded. Um, so at the end result was we we told the Corps of Engineers that if you want to minimize the loss of fish, just release more fish in a day than at night and limit your releases at night to a, a thousand cubic feet a second. But we really didn't have any problem with that fish loss affecting the, the crappie fishery in, fishery in the reservoir. How about that? And yeah. so, you know, talking about the big crappie lakes there in, in North Mississippi, as fisheries coordinator at MDWFP, how do you describe what it's like sort of over the course of time having a grasp on the different types of fisheries? Because obviously like Enid yeah. is so much different than Bay Springs, which is so much different than Ross Barnett and those kinds of things. It seems like it'd be a lot for one man to be able to understand and kind of have a grasp of all that. Well, we've got a, a great biologist up there, Keith Mills, and a, a really good assistant, Arthur Dunn, and a, and a new uh, lady, uh, Katie, and um, so over the years, just in, he has all those four flood control reservoirs, but over the years, we see that uh, trolling has become very oh, popular. Yeah. Right. And now you've got live scopes. So he studied all that and sampled uh, the fish populations. And every four years, he does uh, Grenada okay. on a, uh, what's called an angler survey. So when you're talking to anglers uh, or you're using live scope or you're trolling a uh, poll uh, rate the satisfaction of your fishing today. So we've had to raise the minimum size limit to 12 inches. Mm -hmm. We've had to reduce the creel limit to 15 fish per day to spread the harvest out. But fortunately, those reservoirs are very productive, and, and the fish grow fast. Uh, without that growth, you, you, it would take them a longer time to reach the legal size that you can harvest them. Which would, I would guess, then really affect the decision-making on the size limits and the creel limits and that sort of thing. That's right. Yeah, I would yeah. think so. Okay, so you mentioned live scope. Uh -huh. That's one thing I'm fascinated with. Of, I try to think of technology that has kind of shot you know, the, the sport of fishing forward over the years. And it's hard to come up with anything that has advanced it in terms of numbers of catches and big fish more than live scope has. So my question first on that is, has, has since, you know, live scope has become affordable and more fishermen use it, are you seeing more large lunker fish caught more often, like across the state? I think that... It from what I know of Keith's study, um, they catch fish at a faster rate, but they seem to do more culling okay. uh, because uh, they can target bigger fish because, you know, you can see them. Mm -hmm. So, um, but you still have the, the creel limits in place, the daily limits, and you still have the size limits in place. Um, so... I think he also said there's going to there's seems to be a shift from trolling back to single pole right. because they mm. can catch fish at a faster rate right. and they can target big fish rather than having a bunch of poles out there. How about that? Yeah. 
So, so it really has affected the technique. We just, you know, as fishermen, yeah. we like to be able to see on the screen, there he is, there's my bait, and sort of the challenge of that. That's neat, yeah. getting away from the trolling. Um, another question regarding the fisheries in the state. Chip and I were talking about this earlier. Uh, the difference in the type of vegetation that we run into on different bodies of water. Mm-hmm. It, we talked about hydrilla and, of course, you know, pads that we see at Barnett and that sort of thing. In your years of doing this and and uh, and approaching the challenge of managing vegetation and fisheries, how do you know on what certain body of water uh, enough grass is the right amount, or in this body of water it's too much, and then what to do about it? What's that whole process been like? Well, it's um, there's some literature that points to uh, twenty to forty percent coverage of plants. In, in a water body is going to produce the maximum amount, you know, poundage of fish. Okay. But there are certain plants like um, water hyacinth, hydrilla, giant salvinia, alligator weed that are very invasive, right. and you can't ignore them. You, you have to treat them because they will proceed to cover, you know, everything, the whole surface in the water body for the floating plants and uh for like hydrilla which is a uh underwater plant uh yeah that would would, uh, really take up too much of an area so uh it depends on the type of the plant uh where it is uh the amount that you have Mm -hmm. uh it may be interfering with a good bank fishing area it may be in a, a channel where you need boat traffic. Mm-hmm. Um, so it, all those things come into play. So it's a little bit like a like putting a puzzle together. You look at a body of water. So like you say, w- areas where people fish from the bank a lot, you don't want, you know, obviously vegetation to take over. That eliminates that. Or a, a, a channel where boats are going to travel. Mm-hmm. But 20 to 40% is actually good for the body of water. Yes. Because... Plants um, provide shade. They uh, provide attachment sites for insects and snails. They, uh, which the fish go, some fish go to feed on. Mm-hmm. Um, they provide cover for little fish like uh, you know the sunfishes, bluegill, red ear. They get in there and they're trying to hide from the predator fish like like bass and crappie. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so there's a lot of good things that plants provide. What, what's, uh, what's an example of a body of water in Mississippi where if it's not managed, where quickly that vegetation would take over? S- some things that you've dealt with. Well, I think uh, one example that I can remember is uh, uh, Ross Barnett Reservoir because it's relatively shallow. Yeah. The average depth is about four feet. You have lots of uh, shoreline areas, and that that tends to be where plants grow, where the sunlight can get to the bottom and, and the seeds will germinate. So I remember years ago, they the reservoir people weren't too much concerned, but when water hyacinth got into the main harbor mm-hmm. <laughs> and blocked the, it made boating getting out of the main harbor <laughs> difficult, they, they uh, uh, hired some firms to do that and... Uh, we're actually doing the, the plant control for them right now, have been for several years at Ross Barnett. At Ross Barnett. Yeah. You know, it's interesting. So the average depth at Barnett is just four feet. Mm-hmm. I don't know that a lot of people who maybe who drive by it or they're on the trace and you see that huge body of water that it actually registers that the average depth is about four feet. That yeah. seems really shallow average. Yeah, that is. Uh, <laughs> you can have a pond with average depth like that, four or five feet. Yeah. Uh, of course, it's deeper near the dam, right. you know. But uh, and in the channel in the middle, if you stay around the buoys, which is the purpose of the buoys, uh, is to to keep you from knocking, you know, the foot off your motor yeah. or hitting a stump or something like that. Or yeah, uh, and and when we have a big drought, I can't. Maybe it was around two thousand, two thousand one, or somewhere in there. Uh, you know, the reservoir was really low, and people could see the vast I- expanses of, uh, you know, 
mud (laughs) (laughs) adjacent to the shorelines. Right. And I think, you know, probably some of that this past year, that huge drought that we had, um, you know, this past year, I saw a lot of empty creeks and streams that you normally see water in, too. So I think, you know, shallower lakes, ponds probably suffered as well. Um, Fisheries coordinator. Yeah. So, it you know, it's a title that, you know, it's kind of at the top of that pyramid, but there's so much that's involved. If someone that didn't know were to ask you, fisheries coordinator, like, what is that? What do you do? How, how would you answer that question? Uh, I do a bunch of different things, but <laughs> mainly it's to support the people in the field, mm. um, to um, uh, feel like a juggler sometimes. I'm juggling a bunch of projects. Uh, like, it might be one week, um doing a uh, commercial fishing brochure based on the latest rule. Uh, It's uh, public relations. There's a little bit of marketing as needed. Uh, It's um, uh, contact with other fisheries biologists in other states. Mm. Like, for uh, example, on aquatic uh, invasive species, nuisance species, yeah. Mm. Um, it's writing uh, or managing grants that come to the agency or come to researchers. So paying their bills, submitting documents to that have to be submitted to mm-hmm. to get that, um, making changes to regulations, uh, recommending changes to laws, um, New new products like this book. Yeah, I saw the show and, and tell. That's a great looking book yeah. there. Mississippi University Extension Service, mm-hmm. Southeastern Aquatic Plants. Aquatic plants, yeah. Which we were just talking about mm-hmm. there. Yeah. yeah. So uh, it, it's things like that, a bunch of different things. Uh, uh, I really had fun when I was out in the field mm-hmm. because, you know, you're in boats and you're talking to anglers or you're setting nets or using chemicals or electricity to catch fish. So that's what I think the ideal uh, job is for people who, who want to be, you know, a fisheries biologist. I'm more of an administrator. I push paper around and, you know, I coordinate, talk to people <laughs> and try to get projects off the ground, that type of thing. Sure. But, but all those years in the field is mm-hmm. what prepares you to be able to do that after, I mean, you're, working on 40 years here, you know, mm-hmm. in the department, all those years in the field, you're in a position to kind of know where they're coming from and what they're dealing with. That's correct. Yeah. And we write uh, fisheries management plans for all of our priority waters. Like, and it's, a, it's a, a plan or a goal. What do we want this water body to produce and how are we going to achieve that based on our sampling and based on what anglers who are fishing that water body what they tell us, you know, for instance, at our state fishing lakes, we might have um, a lot of little bass running around, which is a common situation because people don't seem to harvest bass today. Yeah. Well, if you have decent growth, uh, uh, the bass are going to eat up most of the bluegill that are produced. So they're going to be hungry and you're going to have a bunch of little bass, but you're going to have brim bluegill and red ear the size of your hand Mm -hmm. and so if the the main clientele around there is bluegill or brim fishermen you just you just basically monitor it Mm -hmm. you know right um and but if it's bass fishing and you have a poor bass population uh you have to try to build it up and by having a high length limit a minimum length limit and hope there's, you know, good recruitment, which means like recruitment in fisheries means uh, everything from spawning growth up to harvestable size. Okay? okay. And if you have a good recruitment, you have year classes of fish right. uh, following along. Yeah. If recruitment is poor, you might want to, uh, in addition to, having a high minimum length limit to protect those spawning fish, have, uh, do some supplemental stocking. Right. To basically kind of spur it on a little bit. Right. Depending on the, the size of the yeah. body of water and where it is. Yeah. It makes a lot of sense. And, okay, so you mentioned 
that whole decision process right there is based on people. And the license holder, the the outdoorsman, do they have a lot of people here who want to catch brim? Or is this a lake where people drive up in their bass boat and they have tournaments they want to catch? You've got to work with the people and the fishermen and figure out what the lake needs to be kind of based on that? Yeah, it's actually a fishery is three things. It's the fish, it's the people, and it's the habitat. Okay, Those three things come together. Um, we, we, we can know what people want at a water body, but uh, is is the water body fertile? Now, clear water is relatively infertile. Okay. Do we need to apply lime and fertilizer to boost the plankton population, which is at the base of the food chain, so um, to improve the fertility of the water, to encourage fish growth? So all that comes into play. Yeah, there's a lot to it. Yeah. <laughs> you mentioned invasive species mm-hmm. um, in the state of Mississippi. I know this is a broad question, and, yeah. and that's broad. I mean, the coast is Mississippi, but so is Pickwick, the two different things. But invasive species in Mississippi, what are at the top of that list that, that we deal with? Well, in terms of abundance and distribution, um, silver carp okay. and bighead carp, this was fish you've seen videos of. Look like a big minnow jumping out of the water. Yeah, just flying everywhere. Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, we have a couple of tilapia uh, populations on the coast. Okay. Um, let's see, giant salvinia would be one. Uh, some invasive plants. Um, we don't seem to have problems with zebra mussels. Mm. Uh, we've got some snails, big snails. Uh, island apple snails on the coast. We, well, we do have snakeheads along yeah. the Mississippi River. Um, they don't seem to uh, uh, impact our native fish too badly. You know, of course, they're at a low population right now. Um, Why so? They they tend to like swampy, ditchy areas that the bass are not in okay, okay? Yeah. Uh, in the chesapeake bay they more may co- uh, compete more with bass but uh, they're eating mainly minnows up there it's not like you know they're replacing all the the game fish right so so the big head carp it, you mm-hmm. know a lot of people myself included kind of fascinated by that because like you said we have seen those viral videos you know a, yeah. a boat planed off going, you know, whatever, 25, 30 miles an hour, and there are fish flying everywhere because it disturbs them. Um, what what are the, when we say invasive, what are the measures and, like, how much of a threat are they to just continue to move throughout creeks and streams and go everywhere? So invasive, there's a there's a standard definition of that and is, is basically – um, causing or is likely to cause harm to the environment and uh, people. Uh, and okay. so right now we really don't know. We, we know where they are uh, and we're funding research on their effects, the literature that's out there on their effects on native species um, how they get through barriers, like at mm-hmm. Eagle Lake, the muddy bayou structure, the steel bayou structure, yeah. um, uh, some decision making with other biologists about if you had money to put a a barrier in the Tennessee Tom Bigby River system, where would you put it to try to limit their spread? And so certain uh, techniques. Um, particularly in a confined area like a lock chamber, uh, like uh, carbon dioxide, bubbles, light, sound, electricity, all those things can help uh, prevent them from passing a certain point. Are are there other states, I would assume, that are dealing with it also that you kind of collaborate with oh yeah 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 that's uh they're all throughout the mississippi river basin yeah. silver carp and big head carp so we have uh basin wide plans we have a lower mississippi river basin plan we have a uh tennessee cumberland 
River Plan, Upper Mississippi River Basin. So, yeah, we talk about things, uh, and there's funding available from the federal government, so people submit projects, and then the group decides, based on available funding, uh, what we're going to proceed with. Yeah. Yeah, very cool. Um, I saw this recently on the Mississippi Department of Wildlife Fisheries Facebook page. Um, it was congratulating you, mm-hmm. uh, fisheries coordinator. You got the Lifetime Achievement Award at the 2024 Mississippi chapter of the American Fisheries Society's meeting. Lifetime Achievement Award. Mm-hmm. Um, what what was that like to receive that award? And, and well, to- it was it was uh, humbling, uh, but it was uh, rewarding because. I don't. I think there's uh, one of the best things uh, you can receive is the uh, appreciation of people in your field mm-hmm. that are basically saying, "We think you did a good job," or, you know, "We think you made a difference." You know, mm-hmm. so and if you stick around long enough, I think <laughs> you're gonna get it. <laughs> but. Uh, <laughs> Uh, you know, I think that, uh, you know, giving back to uh, professional organizations and, and the field in, to try to make a difference is uh, what people should strive for in their career. So that's what I tried to do. Well, and obviously you have and have been recognized for it. But, but when you say that phrase, uh, what you strive for in a career, um, you know, it could be asked of a of – a, you know, uh, an incoming employee. Hey, right. you know, what do you want to accomplish in your career? For you, it, if if I present you that question right now, and and you've had so much career that's behind you, but mm-hmm. you still got some in front of you, what do you hope to accomplish? From now to retirement? Yes. Well, I think that um, we get questions all the time about different water bodies in the state and can I fish there uh, is there access? So uh, our uh, uh, Mississippi Information System uh, employees have built a database that I'd like to get on the website where you you type in a name like Blue Lake or, or you know you hit a county and you push a button and all the lakes come up and it will tell you, you know, who owns it whether there's a public or a paid ramp there, um, that would really be good, I think. Um, let's see. I'd like to have a fish poster of a bunch of non-game fish. We mm. have a fish poster of, of the game fish and some uh, commercial fish, but there's, I mean, there's hundreds of, of little species out there, minnows, darters, uh, chubs, and things that are, are in the creeks that – People probably that they never see unless they go out there with a dip net, right? Or the, you know, there's something called micro fishing now, with very small hooks and and uh, short uh, rods that yeah. people actually fish. Now, is that ultralight or is micro even smaller than that? Smaller than that. Okay. Smaller than that. Yeah. So those are some of the things um, I would like to see our community and uh, urban. Uh, fishing program expand and this is where um, like example would be uh, Lake Dockery in South Jackson um, Lake Patsy in Oxford uh, where the department signs an agreement with the entity that owns it usually it's a city or county and we write a management plan for them and we do the recommendations for them and provide them with free fish if they need it. Mm. And um, the the city or the county sets the use regulations, like who can fish there, the times that it's open for fish. So we're using the knowledge of our biologists to help cities and counties improve fishing on their water bodies. Because typically, someone who goes into parks and recreational management, they don't learn about fisheries management. Yeah. Yeah. It's really fascinating to hear that. And, you know, I know it sounds like I'm trying to flatter you, but I, it's really an observation. You know, you look at your time here mm-hmm. at what's accomplished 
I would say that if that's on the list of goals, then it's probably just a matter of time before you'll accomplish it. Is that how you feel? I hope so. <laughs> you never know. Um, sometimes you put out, we call it putting out brush fires. Yeah, sure. And the phone rings or emails or, you know, something happens and, and uh, yeah. you got to kind of hop on it. Yeah, uh, sure. I like, uh, it's really, it's always a pleasure, like, when you get to see a big fish, mm-hmm. like I got to uh, to do the uh, to certify the state record largemouth bass, it, I was like the only one in the office. It was like New Year's Eve. <laughs> now, when was that again? In ninety two. Ninety two. And am I right? I may be remembering wrong. Natchez. In Natchez, yeah. And what was the lake? So tell me what you remember about that. Well, I got a phone call, and my boss said you need to get down to Natchez. So there's been a big bass caught, and you need to go certify it and i want you to x-ray it to make sure there's no lead stuffed in there (laughs) and so um i got down there and uh, bobby cleveland the long time uh sports writer for uh the clarion ledger was there and the guy anthony denny was there and and yeah i put it on the length board and looked at it and and uh so we got it x-rayed somewhere and then we had to get a certified weight which was uh 18.15 pounds and so, um, you know, the sun was going down. I had a, 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 a manual camera, a Pentax K1000, but I had him kind of kneel in front of the truck with our emblem <laughs> there, and I snapped a couple pictures. Yeah. But, yeah, that was, that was really cool to do that. That is really cool. Yeah. You know, you hear, sometimes we throw around the term, you know, once in a lifetime this or a once in a lifetime that. Mm-hmm. But an 18-pound state record largemouth, I mean, for all we know, once in a life, once in many lifetimes, that, yeah. that could be what that is. And how cool it was for, that, yeah. that you're there at that time to get that yeah. phone call. It, uh, and like the guy, he was going to go deer hunting, and it was too hot. So he, he said, well, I'll just go to Natchez <laughs> and go fishing. And, and look what he caught. And the rest is history. Yeah. That's really cool. Yeah. Dennis, a real pleasure to talk to you. Uh, uh, a long time went by quickly. It meant we were having fun. Real pleasure That's for right. me to get to meet you and talk to you. Congrats on everything, and thanks for being here. Oh, yeah, I enjoyed it. Yeah, I'll come back soon. Absolutely. Love to have you soon. Okay. That's Dennis Rickey, Fisheries Coordinator, Mississippi Department of Wildlife, Fisheries, and Parks, here on the Mississippi Outdoors Podcast. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you outdoors.